machine learning is effectively a subfield of AI. So if you think of AI as this general artificial intelligence capability, then within that space, there's a field of machine learning that's actually, you know, had tremendous impact in the past about a decade, I would say. Now, AI itself is general AI, as we call it, is a remarkable capability that we've been wanting to unlock since about the 60s, but it's actually still taking a long time and we're not there yet. But machine learning, which sort of focuses on looking for patterns in data, in effect, it learns from repeatedly showing it different kinds of patterns and it tries to infer those patterns in new data that come about has really had a massive amount of impact in the field, and we'll talk about some of the applications in this space. And what, specifically within machine learning, there is this notion of what we call as deep learning. Deep learning is a very specific type of machine learning that focuses on using neural networks, where we're trying to effectively mimic the way the brain works and try and implement that in a hardware software sort of scheme, and do that by giving it lots of data. Because it's trying to learn from patterns that it's seeing, you need to have lots of data. Building big data centers and building big compute engines that consume like 300 watts or 6,000 kilowatts, but it doesn't actually, six kilowatts, um, doesn't actually make sense. And the good reasons for this. Think about like a traditional data center. What happens? You've got a whole bunch of data that actually has to go out all the way to the data center or the cloud, wherever that is, right? But think about like your smartphone. What's the thing that's actually different about your smartphone? Why is it that you? Why is it that we actually want to carry smartphones? Why can't we just, um, you know, stay tethered to the landlines or actually just use the computational power that's available on our desktops? It's mobility and access. It's the ability to kind of be in the spot when you are, where you are, and do what you want to do with it. It fundamentally falls down into the notion of how much power you're consuming for different things, what's the amount of bandwidth you need to have, and what's the latency. More specifically, it's actually blur. It's an easy acronym that I was thinking about this morning. B, B effectively stands for bandwidth. L stands for latency, how long it takes to actually be able to interact with the service. E stands for energy efficiency, because you're often dealing with um, the need to transmit data. When you're transmitting data, it actually consumes much more energy than actually recomputing it where the data actually is. Um, R talks about real-time capabilities, and P talks about data privacy. Generally, we're seeing that there's increasingly a trend of moving AI capabilities out from the cloud into where you know, the, the devices really are. This is not to say that data centers are no longer gonna be using these technologies or something. It's that we're unlocking new capabilities as we bring AI closer to us. Now, what we're also starting to witness is that we're starting to see more consumer devices that are actually intelligent around us. A classic example is your Alexa device or your Google Home okay, or a smart TV. Now, what's really interesting about these devices is that they're really close to where the data resides. They're ubiquitous in a sense, in, in the sense of the world that we're expecting to be in another decade is gonna be, every single system is actually smart and intelligent. Now that could be a toaster oven, a coffee machine, or this home assistant. And what's beautiful about this is that they're all got rich number of sensors. And that's suddenly starting to unlock a whole new range of capabilities. Every if, if, imagine if you are able to detect patterns in the data, which is what deep learning is all about. And imagine then if you look at all these small little devices that are all around us and you start using this data that's actually coming out of these sensors, imagine the capabilities that we can unlock. You can have a smart toothbrush, right? You have a smartwatch already. It's already got machine learning and deep learning capabilities to monitor your health, for instance. Google assistants, home assistants of different kinds. Uh, you can buy an oven in the next five years, I'm sure, which you can actually talk to without ever having to push a button. The notion of touch is going to disappear. It's all going to be conversational AI with these systems. Tiny machine learning is undoubtedly one of the fastest growing fields within machine learning. It sits sort of at the intersection between algorithms, machine learning algorithms, embedded systems, tiny little devices, and all the software stack that goes with it. One of the reasons the TinyML is really powerful is the fact that we're going to be doing on-device sensor data analytics now. This is remarkably powerful because imagine if you have a lot of sensors that are out there, then what you can actually do with all of that data. And you want to process that data not by sending it off to the cloud the way we are doing things now. Rather, you want to react to that data in real time. Right? And that's the fundamental difference. And you're going to do this with ultra low power consumption because you want this machine learning to be running continuously. I'm not talking about where you take a picture and the phone uses machine learning to enhance it. That's an on-demand kind of thing. I'm talking about running this machine learning capability continuously, right? And the reason you wanna do that is because you wanna be able to get 
rich value out of all that sensor data stream that is floating by, which is that volume of data that I was mentioning. And you want to do all of this on the, you know, on something like a coin cell battery. Forget the notion of actually sticking something to a power connector. There are many reasons why you don't want to do that. So battery operated devices with machine learning is effectively what we're going to see in the future. And this is going to have remarkable transformative impact in terms of industry 4.0. I'm talking about manufacturing, I'm talking about medical, I'm talking about health, I'm talking about just everyday consumer devices. There are massive opportunities across many different application spaces, all because it's all about sensing data. If you can sense the data and you can process that data in real time, right where the data resides, you can unlock a whole new range of kind of cap capabilities. And that's what TinyML is all about at the end of the day. How do we bring equity in the ecosystem for this technology? Because if we don't do this now consciously, we're gonna create a new social divide at a global scale. I guarantee you this. We have to have an on-ramp where we do something like the fundamentals of TinyML, where we teach people the basic language and try and get them to understand what this is about. And then we go into interesting applications and finally they go into actually deploying things onto the device. So it's that progressively it gets harder and harder. And this is just one small step towards widening access to applied ML. And it's part of a bigger ecosystem that we're actually working on with edX at this point.